the Scantron has no idea about the uh, clicking questions. So the percentage that you have on there is inaccurate. In other words, that's not your percentage on the test. Okay, that's your percentage on the Scantron, but the Scantron is only part of the test. So, shh, 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 shh. So, uh, what I'm telling you is that the raw score, of course, is correct. And that's on the printout as well. And so what you do is, and what I will do in the next day or so, maybe by Thursday, I will add in your clicking points, which are already up. And I'll probably double check them one more time before I finalize them. Uh, and then I'll add together the raw score from this sheet. And then those two numbers make up your full exam uh, one grade and it will be like that for every exam now exam two we might have 42 dots and eight points from clicking or we might have 47 points from scantron and only three from cl clicking it varies but it's usually somewhere between 40 uh, and 50 scantron sometimes i don't have any clicking on the test just depends on how i feel question Okay, the question, students, I want you to be quiet. All right, it's a little bit too loud in here. We have important things to do and not much time to do it. The question was, since the clicker points are already up, and can you mentally add the two numbers together? Yes, you may. You may mentally do it. You may do it on pencil and paper. And that'll be what you get. I mean, I always give, and the data, your Scantron scores, are in web courses, but I have it muted. You can't see it. Um, and because I always hand back the exam printouts first instead of, you know, publishing the score in on your grades page. So that'll be tonight when I do that. So yeah, mentally just add them up and, you know, and then divide by 50. And that'll be the true percentage. All right. So don't be deceived by that. Now, another thing I want you to do is look on your exam printout for bubbling errors. And I already talked to two students that uh, blooped up their PID. And uh, we had a student in the afternoon session, or maybe this session, that bubbled in all four test form, A, B, C, and D. Okay, don't do that. One test form and one good PID. Now, what I want you to do is look on your exam um, questions and see if it's marked blank. All right, if it is, that means that... Um, You've either forgot it, in which case that's a true blank and a true incorrect mark, uh, or you didn't bubble it in dark enough, in which case the computer missed it and thought it was a blank and marked it incorrect. Now, if you have one of those, I want you to, in the next week or so, and definitely before the final, talk to me if you have a blank. Also, if you have two answers, Every question on this test had only one answer. It was either A or B or C or D or E, but not a combination of two. All right, so if you have two um, letters marked on your um, answer on that column, that means that you bubbled in one, tried to erase it, and didn't, and then bubbled in a second one. And one of them is cor might be correct, but if you have two dots, that'll be marked wrong. All right, so we want to know about that. So the only way is for me to dig it out of the pile of Scantrons. Now, you saw how big that pile of exam printouts was, and the Scantron pile is just as thick. So it's a pain in the you-know-what. Uh, but we'll do it if you have it, okay? But it'll take a, a little bit of time um, for us to do that. Now... I want you to keep the printout because it is a nice study tool to get ready for the final exam. Because every um, after every midterm, I publish a little blurb sheet uh, with a, a real simple description of what each multiple choice question is. Now the matching I can't do that for, but they're pretty basic anyways. The, the multiple choice at true false, it'll say mm, basic calculation of free fall or uh, 
third law concepts or example of something. And I'll publish that as a PDF file in web courses. And then you'll be able to look at the problems from your printout that you now have and say, okay, my basic problem, I kept getting third law problems incorrect. Well, then by the, f by, by the time you're re ready to study for the final, you'll know, do some extra study on Newton's third law or whatever the topic is that you had a pattern of missing. Now, you may have just had a, a, a bunch of random errors, and, but you still t it will still tell you, okay, you better study up this, this, and this. Now, the printout that you have now doesn't tell you that, but the printout plus the blurb sheet that I'll publish this week in web courses will tell you that. And we can go over it during uh, office hours. If you, if you come to office hours, you know, we can certainly do that, talk it over. All right. Now, questions about your printouts. Yes. Yes, you may. The question was, if you, for whatever reason, didn't get your printout this morning when I was going through the list, and when Darian was going through the list, um, and since we can't pick them up after class, which is what I normally do, dismiss a little early and, and give out exams, uh, you can pick them up during my office hours, okay? And next Monday, when Dar did anybody go to Darian's office hours yesterday? I don't know if she had any. Did you have? You have, uh, and you have uh, SI tonight too, right? Okay. Uh, so Darian will have access to them as well. So uh, either my office hours or Darian's, or if I do dismiss five minutes early, I will have time. You know, we might dismiss early today. Probably not, but all right. So we'll get it. You know, just catch it as catch can. And that brings up another thing. As I mentioned, you want to get here early. So that when I call your name, you know, like there's a guy in the back that came up to the front, and I was already three deep past his name by the time he got up here to the front. So when I call your, if I say, okay, A's and B's come up to the front, um, H, I, J, K, up to the front, get up to the front and be ready to get it because I have to go through the list fast. It's just a, such a huge class, and Darian had to leave in the middle of it, and that's all, all the help I have, so it, it takes a long time. Question? The question was, for office hours, do you have to make an appointment or can you just walk in? You may just walk in. Uh, it's a just drop in. And bring questions, anything that you want to work on. I don't have any agenda. I'm just doing there, uh, messing around with grades and stuff like that. So uh, if you, But if you have something you want to go over, like, you know, you have a blank on, on your printout, we'll get it sorted out in office hours. All right, one last question. Okay, let's continue. The average on this test was 60-something, high 60s. I haven't got the final uh, average yet uh, because I still have exams to put in. But I try to get an average of about 70. So this one's a little bit low. And it, it, it happens. Sometimes it's a little bit high. Sometimes it's a little bit low. It just depends. Okay, also, uh, for most of you, Exam one ends up being, or for many of you, I, I, usually it's a majority of students, exam one is the exam that you end up dropping. You know, keep your best two, drop your lowest on the syllabus. Uh, under that principle, what ends up getting tossed is usually exam one. Now, for some people, this is your top grade of the semester. You don't know it yet, but, you know, there's a few students that this is actually their best grade. Uh, but f whatever your best two grades are, those are the ones we'll keep. And so if you have a grade that's a little bit lower than what you're hoping for, um, do not uh, despair. And just remember, we ha if, you, if you study your you-know-what off for exams two and three and start crushing things with impunity, uh, you'll be able to ditch this one. And, and God bless you. You know, I'm happy to toss that for you. All right. 
Now, let's look ahead and talk about things to get ready for exam two, because I know there was uh, a lot of students asking and concerned about it. First of all, if you want to do a better, if you're looking at your grade and you think, okay, I know that I only got two points on clicking, so I had 32 out of 50, that's a 64. That's, that, that would be below average. Um, and you want to get a higher uh, grade on the next one, first of all, participate in SI, okay? Automatically is going to help you every time. Also, come to office hours in the Physical Sciences Building, PSB. Now, Darian has, do you know when Darian's office hours are? Does anybody know? It's Monday afternoon, 1 to 2? Okay. Um, so every, every Monday afternoon, 1 to 2, Darian's in the atrium of the Physical Sciences Building. Every Wednesday, 9 a.m. to noon, I'm in room 158, which is right off the atrium. It's the little solarium type room. Uh, and we had a bunch of students down there uh, on, on Wednesday uh, last week to get ready for the midterm. And that's a good strategy. It's always good to study with me. And it's also really good to study with Dare and also with Shy. All right. Now, another good study technique is to find a study partner. And I saw a lot of people. Uh, you know when you guys were doing it, though? You were doing it Wednesday night, Wednesday and you know, Tuesday night and Wednesday, you know. You want to do it a little bit more lead time so that you get in a good group and stuff. So find a partner or a study group, maybe, and uh, just meet, you know, every Thursday night or, you know, whatever, you, you know. And that is going to help. And as I always say, on my exams, you're going to find that they are challenging. And I, I hope that there weren't that you f did not feel that the calculations on the test were there was one rough calculation the very last one and clicking but the other ones were fairly basic but the concept questions that I gave you were fit for a king so to speak in other words quite challenging and so to do to navigate that and perform well and think your way through to the correct answer. What did I just say? To think your way through to the right answer, you got to think. And studying with a group, studying with uh, me or Darian or uh, SI is going to help you think. And that is the end objective for the semester. You know, and many of you are going to find, just simply because you're two years older, or three years older than the last time you took a science class in high school for many of you. You know, you're a little more mature, your brain's a little bit, uh, better, hopefully, and uh, you start putting things to better, together better. But groups really help. Another thing, um, leverage the um, lecture video to rework your notes. I was talking to uh, Darianne while we were working Thursday afternoon on the answer keys, we were, we, were, we were bubbling. For every exam that you bubble in, I have to bubble in four because I have to bubble in four answer keys, A, B, C, and D, all right? And, and then I have to do it again for the other section. So we were in there bubbling in answer forms and stuff and talking, and she said, oh, yeah, Dr. B, I used to listen to the lecture and rework my notes and make them perfected, you know, get the notes perfected and add and, and edit and stuff like that. And it she said it really helps. Um, also, keep your eye on the highlights uh, that I have in the e-text. Uh, raise your hand if you're able to see my highlights. Okay, now that's a good number. Raise your hand if you still haven't figured it out how to look at my highlights. Okay, well, maybe I better not ask for a show of hands. I know there's a bunch of you, but there's a bunch that n do know how. So try to, let me see a, a show of hands. Who knows how to look at my highlights in e-text? All right, look, the rest of you, look around. See if you're friends with any of these people. If you're not, make friends with some of them, okay? And just kind of coordinate with them. It can be done. And the problem is I'm, I have the teacher version of the software, so I can't really see how it works for you guys. I can't really give you good tips on that. 
uh, but your comrades and your classmates can. So try to do that. So in general, these are some tips that I share with you for if, if you want to do well, and if you plan to do well, you can do well. I don't want anybody in here to be um, discouraged in the least. And it's, it's, it, my class is different than maybe some other classes that you've had in the past. So the, the, the ticket for you is to adapt. Or as Bruce Lee used to say, be water, my friend. Okay, because water adapts to any shape, any style. He was talking about kung fu fighting style. Uh, the style with no style. That's what he was about. Uh, but anyways, um, follow those tips. Create your own tips. Be water, my friend. And we'll see you at exam too. Um, now, uh, nice, nice news for those of you that like closed captioning. Um, we have finally gotten it all together, and they are starting to come through every day after every lecture. Uh, lecture one and lecture two, or morning lecture and afternoon lecture. It looks like this. Um, you know, here's the here's the actual movie up here, and then down here in the bottom, it says this is where that this is me talking. Exerts on the moon, and then I said the word seventy three. You know, it's kind of interesting. What was I talking about? Where the number seventy three comes in? It must have been seventy three skillion newtons of force, because we were talking about third law here. So whatever the Earth exerts on the moon, the moon exerts on the Earth. Anyway, so that's where the the uh, the uh, closed captions are going to be down the middle of the screen. And so down in this part of the screen, uh, from now on, I'm going to be trying to keep this area free uh, and clear so that the uh, there won't be any conflict with the closed captions. All right, so hopefully uh, everybody will like that uh, and use it. And, and I know many of you have already started and told me about it. Okay, now last time we worked out the skateboard example, Bob and Carl. And the thing about this is we had, and you could just jot this down for review, uh, we had equal interaction forces. And it was kind of an idealized hypothetical example. You know, 500 newtons left, negative 500 newtons, and 500 newtons right positive 500 newtons. Um, and we said that, all right, these babies are going to interact for a certain amount of time with those two forces or by those two forces. All right, so here they go. They're interacting. And by the time you got to 0 0.48 seconds, they broke contact and had acquired um, new velocities. The final velocity for Carl was off to the right. The final velocity for Bob was off to the left. Now, we worked all that stuff out. We used F equals MA, Newton's second law. We used the third law, action and reaction. Uh, and the, the weird thing that we found and that I asked you about on the exam was even though the interaction forces are the same size, the final velocity states are not the same. And I asked you why that was. Many of you got the answer to that correct. The answer is that the masses are different. So there is a requirement uh, when you're studying the dynamical states of any object to factor in the inertia of that object, the mass. So mass and velocity uh, are important. And the other th thing that we found was that the contact times, yeah, they're the same, of course, by definition. You know, if he's in contact, if Carl's in contact for 0.48 seconds with Bob, then Bob, by definition, is in contact with Carl for the same amount of time. But their positions after that period of acceleration were definitely not the same. Bob was larger, so he didn't accelerate as much, and he didn't cover as much distance backwards as Carl covered uh, going backwards. So there's a lot of inequalities with that. Uh, and what we're going to do uh, later today, possibly uh, Thursday, is we're going to tackle uh, that symmetry issue. And we're going to find 
that by encoding the inertia with the velocity, uh, we will find that this interaction is symmetric, that the dynamical states do have a symmetry, and we can find it uh, by encoding the motion a little bit differently than we have so far. And it's, it's all in chapter four. Now, before we do that, however, I want to talk about uniform circular motion, which was the one little bit of chapter three that I said, okay, we'll, sir, we'll save this for um, after exam one. So let's talk about the Nardo ring. And if you've read the textbook, you'll know a little bit about the city of Nardo in Italy. It's a, it's a place where the, uh, the Italian automaker Fiat built a big circular test track and it, it's down here in the boot heel uh, of Italy and uh, it's just a pretty flat piece of ground and they built a nice big ring and we're going to talk about that uh, in context and the textbook talks about it in deluxe contrast so um, that's our main topic for today uniform circular motion for example the uniform circular motion that every day of the week they're doing down there in uh, Nardo, the south part of Italy. All the European automakers supposedly use that track for testing their equipment. So let's talk about curved trajectories in general. And what I'd like you to do is just draw kind of a uh, general curved path. No particular, don't make it a circle. Don't make it straight. Give it some curve. Make it curvaceous. And on this path, the velocity changes direction. So, the, so when you're on that path, you're, you know, your steering wheel is aimed, your windshield is aimed at different points. You know, you see st different uh, parts of the world through your, through your windshield. Now, if you're going along a drag strip, a straightaway, you see the same scenery at the end of the track, you know, the whole time. And then you decelerate and you stop, your, you, just, you know, you're just going straight ahead. But um, you never see any different view. But on the curve trajectory, yes, you do. Now, the, because of that, the velocity arrow is going to be changing. All right? And therefore, there's going to be an acceleration vector. Simply because changing the direction of the velocity, even if you don't change its speed, uh, means you'll have a delta V. You'll have a delta V vector. All right? And that means that you're going to have an acceleration and also a net force. And what we're going to do is kind of study an interesting example of a curved trajectory here. But first of all, we have to discuss this idea of radius of curvature. Okay? At each point on the curve, there's a radius of curvature. Now, hopefully you've kind of heard that uh, phrase before, radius of curvature. We're going to go into it now in detail and make a geometric picture uh, of radius of curvature for this particular point. So go ahead and choose a point. Uh, here's the point that I'm using this red square. Okay, any point will do. As long as, as, long as it's not on a straightaway. You know, I have a couple short straightaways on here. So, but uh, put it on one of the curved parts, okay? And that's where I've got mine. And what we're going to do is sketch in the velocity vector at this point. And then we're gonna draw in the radius of curvature and the circle of curvature uh, at that point for the track, for the trajectory at that point, okay? So first thing you do is you draw a tangent line at that point. So gracefully sketch it in so it just touches at that one point and no other. It doesn't poke through the curve. It just gracefully touches, tangent, tangible. Tangible means something you can touch. So a tangent line touches at just one point. It doesn't poke through or anything. It just touches at one point. Okay, so just gracefully draw that in. I've got it as a red dotted line. And then let's be... Let's, let's assume that we're moving from the left side to the right side. So my velocity arrow is going to be oriented in that way. All right? 
Now, if I was reversing my direction, I'd be going, you know, from right to left. That's all right. You know, on the way home, you could drive that way. But for this one, let's say that we're driving in that direction. Okay, so the velocity arrow, as I've mentioned before, it's always tangent to the tra trajectory. It's always tangent to the path. All right, so try to draw that in carefully. All right, and let's label it vector v. All right, so this is just some point, and we're just kind of th thinking about it. And, okay, so there's vector v. All right. And what we're going to do now, let me remove this diagram, and let me put in the circle. All right, now that circle is, I've got it backed up. Don't trace yours in yet. This particular circle uh, is just the right match of curvature so that if you, if you ease it in, um, at least for a short distance, it'll follow the exact same path as the, the track that you're on, okay? You see, so for at least a short distance, this is right along the, uh, the path of, uh, right along the actual path. Okay, so I'm gonna bring it in now. All right. So try to get your, just gracefully, now everybody's gonna look different depending on the curve you have in your notebook, All right? That's normal, no problem with that. But kind of make it gracefully, and if you're, okay, if you're not another Leonardo da Vinci for graphing and stuff, just do your best. And refer to the, um, the podcast, the, the video lecture. And because I've done this really carefully with all the geometry. Okay, now, this circle, here's the center right here, this black dot at the center. There's four radii drawn from it, two diameters that are perpendicular, and each diameter has two radii. And so the radius of curvature is one of, is one of those radii, any of those radii. It's the radius of that circle. So the actual center of the circle is controlled by the size of the circle and where it touches the track. There's only one, for any part of the track, there's only one curvature radius and therefore only one center of curvature for that little stretch of track, okay? Now, a couple more concepts here. As I said, it matches the path if only for a few meters. You're not on a circular path, but for a few meters, your racetrack is as if it's on that circle. Now, when you go down the track a few meters, you might have a different size circle. It might be a tighter circle if your turn is getting tighter. Uh, or it might be a bigger circle if you're starting to straighten out into a straightaway. All right? The center of the imaginary circle, this is pretty important, is inside the turn. All right? You can't have a radius of curvature with a center outside. So when you turn to the right, the center of curvature is off to your right. You know, just look off to your right, and it'll be out there somewhere. You know, at some distance. If you turn to the left, you know, the, the center of curvature is going to be off to your left. The velocity vector is tangent to the circle and to the path. All right? And that is going to be pretty important for us, the velocity vector tangent to the circle, because it's going to be perpendicular to the radius. Whatever the radius is, or the, the, the location vector from the center out to that red dot, that red square, uh, that is going to be perpendicular to the radius. Okay? Now, the circle of a circular path has only one radius of curvature. Now, the one that we've got up here on the screen, and it's in your notes, is kind of a generic, just kind of a variable curvature path. But if the Nardo ring, if you're on the Nardo ring, or any other circular path, or if you're out in the parking lot at Publix, uh, you know, at 6 a.m. And, and there's nobody around, you can just drive a nice, you know, just turn your steering wheel to the left, drive a nice left-hand circle in the parking lot if there's no cars, okay? Or you can go down to Nardo in Italy. Okay, so for if, if, you, if you actually have a circular path, one radius of curvature. 
And so there will be one for every point on a circular path, there will be one common center of curvature, and that's the center of the circle. All right, now, there's going to be forces that produce acceleration. Let's talk about that now. And we're going to do an easy example of just driving at a constant speed. So we're going to say, for example, that we're driving along this generic path, uh, which we've kind of studied a little bit, and we're going to go at 10 miles an hour, nice and easy. You know, so this is Grandma Jones driving home from the grocery store with a with a box of eggs. Doesn't want to go too fast and break any eggs. She's oh, you're only allowed to break eggs in the kitchen when you're making some food, all right? But not in the car. So the speedometer is constant, and what that means is that any acceleration is going to be perpendicular to the velocity because if, if the speed is constant, you're not getting any speed up or slow down, okay? So you don't have any newtons or in any acceleration uh, with the velocity. You don't have any against the velocity or even slanted against it. You don't have anything slanted with the velocity. It's just straight perpendicular because there's no speed up if we're going at 10 miles an hour. Now, if you're speeding up, then, yeah, you would have some acceleration uh, that's not perpendicular. But if you're just at constant speed, and that is what uh, my wonderful students, uniform circular motion means perfect circle, constant speed. All right, because that, that's where we're heading for. Do you have a question? You guys? Okay. All right, because the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity, no speed up, no slowdown, that means it's actually along the imaginary radius of the curvature. And therefore, it points toward the inside of the turn, and it, it actually points toward the center of that imaginary circle. Now, if you go down a Daytona racetrack, raise your hand if you've ever been down to Daytona for a race. I've never been down there, but I, you know, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe I, should, maybe I should go once. But if you go down there and talk to the guys, they'll tell you that the, there's three turns, and there's... There's two main turns, and then there's a, a really big radius uh, third turn. And they know by design what the radius, the turning radius is for each of those turns. Okay, And they also have banking on each of those turns. So, um, so it's pretty important. All right? And, and just to reinforce, the reason it points towards the inside of the turn is that it's only changing the direction of the velocity. Now, to, do, to produce that acceleration is going to require a little bit of newtons toward the center of the circle, toward that center of that imaginary circle. Now, it might be small or large depending on a couple factors. So if you're going really fast, okay, so if you're not going 20, uh, excuse me, if you're not going 10 miles per hour, if you're trying to go 50, you better have good tires. Also, if you're trying to make a tight turn, you know, you need good tires. Um, and the net force is going to be toward the center. So, so yeah, those, those tires, they, they have to have a pretty good uh, gripping force that, that they produce by friction. And it's actually, by Newton's third law, it's actually the road surface that gives you that net force toward the center of the turn, toward the center of that imaginary circle. Okay? So if you... So here's two different ways. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a verbal example. For speed. If you... If you go out towards the university, you know, out here by garage A, I think, and you head out off campus and you come to the intersection of Alifay and University, and you're you're heading, you know, west at that point, and you want to turn and go up Alifaya, you've got to make a right turn there. Now if you go at five miles an hour, it's gonna be a very small acceleration. 
But if you try to take it at 25 miles an hour, you're going to get, you know, bumped to the left as your car is accelerating to the right. Okay? Now, the tightness of the curve. Think about the interstate or the, the turnpike. You're traveling at a high rate of speed. So if you try to take, get off the turnpike with a left turn or, excuse me, with a right turn, like the one from University to Alafaya, you're going to go off the road because your tires won't be able to grip strong enough. That's why when you go off the interstate, it's a very easy exit ramp, you know, that goes off with a little bit of curvature, not a whole lot. Well, it's actually a big radius of curvature taking it easy off the interstate. So you can take that at 65 miles an hour, but the left turn from University onto Alfea, no way. You can't take that at 65. And I don't care what kind of car you have taking one of those turns at 65, no way. All right, now let's take a look at the Nardo ring. Here's an overhead view of it from Google Maps. Uh, and, you know, this summer when I was writing this textbook, the section about the Nardo ring, we figured out that we can't use, we can't publish anything from Google Maps. So I had to hand draw the diagram that you see in the book. But this is what I was thinking of. Here's the here's, uh, city of Nardo. And we're just kind of narrowing in on it. And here's the overhead view of the Nardo ring. Now, just a couple, and it's a, you know, uh, a nice test track. You can see some clouds and the shadows of those two clouds. Kind of cool looking. Um, the outermost lane is designed for 100, and it's, it's designed also with a bank. So the radius and the banking angle um, give you an optimal speed of 149 miles per hour um, without having to turn the wheel, the steering wheel. Now, if you want to go a little faster than that, you can crank it a few degrees. Um, but at 149, you just steer straight ahead, and you'll always stay on the Nardo ring, the outer lane of it anyways. And so that's what they're going to use to test drive um, passenger cars and race cars and stuff like that. Now, the inner lane is used for testing trucks, and it's banked a little differently. And its optimal speed is 50 miles an hour. So uh, that's under the, the idea that uh, they're testing, you know, big 18-wheelers and stuff like that. So 50 miles an hour is the working, you know, that's a good example of a working speed for an 18-wheeler uh, out on the highway. All right. Now, um, I want to derive two equations with you. No, I will not go back. Um, I want to go to see Chuck Norris smiling in the context of two, two equations. And in this particular case, because it's almost time to dismiss, Chuck Norris is smiling because he knows that I'm going to dismiss early. So you're dismissed. No homework tonight. I'll see you on Thursday. And if you want to come and try to get your printout, you can come up now for just a minute. Yeah, you're, you're, uh, I, I think I explained all I need to explain. Yeah, yeah your, your, your PID on your Scantron, your 